Now, it's our birthday this week, so do you remember this? <laughs> it's 50 years since ITV began broadcasting in southern England. And that was our name then, Southern, not Meridian. Uh, we were called Southern from August 1958 until TVS took over at the start of 1982. And then we became Meridian in January 93. And there is one man who has worked for all three companies and was there right at the beginning. We've asked Mike Field, who still lives in Wye near Ashford, to cast an eye over five decades of broadcasting history in South East England. Yeah, 50 years, the hovercraft, the Beatles, the Channel Tunnel, Cliff Rescue at Beachy Head. Here's his look back at how TV and the South East has changed so much. Harold Macmillan was the Prime Minister, Elvis Presley topped the charts, and the South East still had a thriving mining industry as well as the busiest ferry port. We were the only company to have our own boat, handy for sea stories such as the arrival of the world's largest hovercraft and the launch of the cross-channel service. Hovercraft, then at the cutting edge of new technology, and invented by a man of the South, Sir Christopher Cockerell. Alas, the documentary I made about him lost, like his machine, in the mists of time. Back from national service in the Trucial Oman Scouts, I pitched up at the new Dover studio for a trial. John Borman was the boss. Yes, the same John Borman who became one of Britain's greatest film directors. He asked me to film the cliff rescue team at Beachy Head, and when the cheque for a fiver arrived, I suggested it was a touch mean for risking my life. Think yourself honoured, you were asked, came the reply. Sadly, the old Dover studio was demolished a while back, and with it, a host of memories. Big names came through Dover in those days. Some we interviewed, some we didn't. The Beatles were turned away because we hadn't got the communication lines from London to record. Although our Southampton colleagues did catch up with them later. Is that right? Yes, we're going in January. February. I don't know why I'm going, actually, but we are going. February. February. But one great star, the greatest, didn't get away. It was equality thing. They were big shots and I was a big shot. They weren't frightened of you, though, were they? No, and I wasn't frightened of them. <laughs> and we had a good time. What about a poem for your next fight with Ernie Schaefer? What's your name? Mike. Mike what? Field. Mike Field. Yeah, he said, a guy named Mike Field, with his accent, would like to talk to you on the telly. I says, all right, uh, the old chap going to pay some money? He says, they do not have a budget. So I wrote a poem about this television interview. Mike, I love your show. I admire your style. But your pay so cheap, I won't be back for a while. <laughs> Good evening from Dover, where I'm delighted to say that the sun is shining. Live outside broadcasts from the Dover studio were rare events, but we were there when the Queen Mother became Lord Warden of the Cinque Ports. I needed a who's who that day. Royal documentaries were even rarer. What do you do when you get a horse that doesn't concentrate? Is there any way you can cope with it? I do somebody else. <laughs> is that what happened? Yes. <laughs> Friday night was the big night when Dover had its own programme for the South East. Everything was live. It all went out, warts and all. Zero resources, so things went wrong. Scary, but fun. It really was a bizarre place, and it was run on a shoestring. And it was like working, for me as a director, it was like working in the Science Museum. I mean, the equipment, we had one of everything. And it was all very old, and when it broke down, you were in deep doo-doo. So the programme was always lurching on the edge of disaster. But I think the public quite liked it. I mean, everything's too slick now. We made lots of mistakes, and they loved them. With Canterbury Cathedral on the doorstep, it was only natural to put God on the Dover agenda, and a local vicar was plucked from obscurity to produce the nightly epilogue. Every night of the year, 365 days a year, there was a five-minute religious program. It was just before closed down. And it was as local as it could be, though we had to produce literally hundreds, actually over 2,000 programs in my time, which were local as far as we could make them. But we also had big shots. We had 
three archbishops of Canterbury, chief rabbi, some famous people, Kenneth Williams and film stars and so on. And your notoriety must have uh, grown by the day. The people who recognised me were publicans and restaurateurs. If I went into a pub, they'd say, oh, hello, because when they got home and the pub was shut, they'd turn on the telly and there was this grinning parson. <laughs> Seaside summer shows and pantomimes were big business in those days, attracting star names like Cilla Black to Eastbourne. I'm a perfectionist, really. I know I don't look perfect, but I think I work hard at looking that way. And more big names tomorrow. Glenda Jackson at Brighton, Bill Oddy on an early bird-watching expedition, Ray Mears deep in the woods of Sussex, and Southern Television helping a beleaguered Kent village.